Hello and welcome to this week's Access Chat. I'm delighted that we're joined today by Caroline Desrosiers, who I had the pleasure of meeting at Emma Neighboring a few weeks ago back in, in Washington, D.C. Carolyn and I started talking about alt text and the work that she's doing with Scribely. Um, those of us that have been in the accessibility field for longer than we care to mention have been talking about alt text for longer than we care to mention, um, mainly because it's sometimes the only thing that people talk about when we're talking about accessibility, that and captions. So I think it is really definitely an important topic, but Carolyn is here because she's taking the pain out of it. So Carolyn, you know, Scribly doesn't just do alt text, it's sort of content accessibility solutions. So, but tell us a bit about yourself, how you got started and the premise behind what you're now doing. Sure, sure. Well, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, yeah, so I, I started Scribly as a, a business to support alt text because um, four and a half years ago when I started my company, um, definitely still a problem. There's a lot of bad alt text out there on the web um, still today, um, even though, as, as Neil said, it gets a lot of stage time. It comes up in conversations a lot. We talk a lot about alt text but uh, organizations are still struggling to get it right. So my company exists to provide um, those actual writing services to help all, get alt text done. Uh, but we also do a fair amount of training and consulting as well with companies um, just to move accessibility forward, um, content accessibility solutions. Um, so not only images, but also videos and podcasts. Uh, so we can also support transcription services as well as audio description script writing. And when I said take the pain out of uh, the, the creation of alt text, I was, was only half joking because actually, you know, whilst as an accessibility person, I understand the absolute importance of describing images, as a, someone with dyslexia, that process of description puts me through my own accessibility pain barrier sometimes, especially if I don't have access to speech recognition tools, which uh, are becoming more ubiquitous, so it's making it easier. Um, but it's a it's a great example of how you know different uh, different parts of the the community have different needs, and that, that actually we sometimes need to rely on services to be universally accessible. How did you get into the field in the first place? Yeah, so before starting Scribly, I worked in digital book publishing, and that's where I first joined an accessibility working group and uh, discovered that uh, image descriptions were quite a challenge um, in publishing. And I was interested in starting a business that could help uh, solve a problem. I just didn't know what at that time, um, but I was just fascinated by accessibility and also frustrated by the problem. I come from a family of educators and it just kind of um, broke my brain when I found when I when I heard that image descriptions were um, not making it into uh, ebooks for the most part and that the, the quality was really suffering. And I thought, well, this is an area that I could support because I love writing. I love working with writers and I want to help solve this problem. So that was originally kind of how the idea um, came into my mind to, to start an image description business and, uh, you know, thought, well, this sounds simple. Just to set, assemble a team of human writers that know what they're doing, develop a process for this work, um, and, and just work with, with organizations that want to get it done. That sounds pretty easy. <laughs> of course it's not. Um, but that original vision is still there. Um, we very much prioritize quality above everything else. And, um, we have a, a, a team of folks who just love to write and uh, are passionate about communicating uh, the content of images. So, yeah. Carolyn, welcome to the program. Uh, I have been um, watching what you are doing a little bit. So I, first of all, I thought it was funny, excuse me, that uh, you started in January, 2020. So just wanna say, wow, okay, good for you. That was cheeky to do that. <laughs> but then, of course, around that time, besides that little pandemic thing we did, um, of course, AI is changing everything. 
And then AI came out and I, I'm in love with AI. I, I'm just, I know it's going to kill us all, but I still love what it's doing to, personally to my own work. And so, but at the same time, it has uh, added um, a whole bunch more confusion to the marketplace. I know that um, I was doing a little training yesterday and people were asking about this specific topic. Oh, oh, the good news about alt text, we got that one solved. All you need to do is just go to AI and AI will do the alt text description for you. Done. Nailed. Check. But of course, that is not true because, you know, the alt text must be meaningful to the image and only the designer, the developer, the content provider knows why you're using that image. And um, so, but at the same time, AI is going to simplify things for us with accessibility. And I just am um, proud of you that you started this business with when you did and, and I applaud it. But at the same time, wow, what a hard time to start a business when we actually, um, we saw when AI really, you know, chat GBT really started getting um, used, um, that companies immediately started laying off their content writers and their social media people. And, um, and we saw disability writers that have been known to write disability all of a sudden well, they're not needed because AI can just do it. Now, of course, we know AI is still learning, but I just wanted to, first of all, applaud what you're doing. Really, really appreciate it, especially as women entrepreneurs. But it's also a really intense time that you came in. But I also believe there's also a real opportunity for you because, once again, we can toss it all to AI and say, figure it out. Of course, that's not going to work. We still, as humans, need to be involved. So, I just thought I'd throw those really, really complicated questions at you as you did this um, during these intense times. But thank you at the same time. Yeah. So, yes, um, you've hit on a few points. Um, alt text has been has been a struggle to get right because you not only have the problem of actually writing the content, but also managing that within workflows. And that's where it breaks down. So over the past four and a half years of being in this business, I've, I've talked to a lot of organizations and sometimes it's not the content writing part of it. Sometimes it's actually the workflow side of things where their systems don't support um, alt text and it's very difficult to um, manage and store that information um, within the systems. And, and then it, it's just a challenge all around. So I think there are opportunities with AI to help finally scale um, this operation of writing image descriptions. And of course, there's so many images on the web. But as you said, it's absolutely important because we're talking about accessibility that these image descriptions are right. People need to be able to trust in this information and the authors of that content that are putting it out on the web need to ensure that, that, that it is correct and that it is the same level of quality as all of the other content that exists on that web page or in that digital document. Um, that's the, uh, you know, the, the, the original reason I started Describely as I was talking about just, you know, that frustration that information should be accurate and true and you should be able to depend on it. That still exists today. I don't want to see um, any sort of quality suffer as a result of using AI. So I think humans absolutely still need to be in the loop. Um, and need to be owning this process and um, using AI potentially to help scale their operations, but not um, completely replacing humans uh, in this work. So Scribly is actually getting involved in collecting research data and you know testing this the generative AI results as alt text experts. That felt like something we really needed to do. Um, so we're uh, currently doing uh, a study on the quality of generative AI descriptions and how that compares to um, human moderated uh, generative AI descriptions and just human descriptions in general. Um, so that's very important research that we need to do right now to make sure that we are hitting the mark with what alt text needs to be. And I do want to just... Um... I know that Antonio is going to come in here, so I'm not going to talk long, but I just think it's so important to have the quality because what we've done is, and so the audience might say, oh yeah, then nice to have. It isn't nice to have. 
We need quality descriptions that really are meaningful. Otherwise, by us just putting out there, I'm not image one, but anything careless image alt text. The reality is you do leave humans out when you're doing that. So I just hope that people are understanding the importance of this conversation because we have to stop checking the easy box and say, okay, did it. No, there's something on there. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense to me. And so I, I just want to uh, validate that. And, but at the same time, I worry, Carolyn, that um, how are y'all going to be funded to do this work that needs to be done? So I hope also any investors and funders are listening in that this is the kind of content we need, real good content that's meaningful. But I think it's wrong to keep asking all of us to do all this work for free. Um, just saying. So Antonio, let me turn it over to you. I want to, to bring another topic that today when we navigate on the web, we, we can easily uh, translate content, no, no, and we can get, you know, it, it, it becomes readable. It is not perfect, but someone that might not uh, be uh, an English speaking can have a good understanding about what that uh, is about. How do you think we should move uh, English into our text? Because many images of the web, English is the dominant language. How can a Spanish person, how can a sp a sp someone that is not native of a certain language can somehow experience alt text that is originally in English in their own language? That's such an interesting question to solve. Um, I am currently looking into, well, how can we start publishing alt text in more than one language? Um, I'm looking at the European, um, the EU directive for accessibility coming out in 2025, where people need to, you know, or organizations need to make sure that their websites are accessible. And all these different versions of websites that we have, we have an English version, we have French version, we have a German version. And it, on each one of those websites, we need to have alt text in that language so that it actually matches, you know, the rest of the content. And so I think translation is going to be a challenge. Uh, because it's it's a challenge enough to get alt text into the alt attribute in English. And now we're talking about these other languages. But really to create a great experience, um, we need humans in the loop involved in that translation operation, that service. Uh, that's absolutely something I'm thinking about and that is critical to solve in the next few years. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, it, it, really, it really is a a, a challenge um, made more difficult, I think, by um, providing that through translation rather than individual, uh, you know, web pages with a language attribute set for each of the different languages. So, um, but frequently, you know, whilst it's possible to translate the text easily, you know, that gets you know the the image descriptions that get left behind. And, and we see similar with um, captions too. Captions are slightly more obvious because you know, they're visible and, and, and so therefore people recognize that there is a language difference and maybe a need to do it. But I think that it's, it's quite easy for people to forget when they're translating pages. Uh, leads me on to a, another point that we discussed when we were um, talking in person a few weeks back which is about um, the persistence of the image descriptions, because um, quite frequently I, I find myself writing image descriptions and then having to sort of store them in notes and, and so on and so forth, because the, the image description doesn't stay with the image um you know so if you're using an image multiple times is that it's not embedded in the image file therefore you're having to apply that as an extra layer and i would love to see that that information you know as as digital standards change because you know the jpeg's been around for a long time the gif or gif has been around for for, for years as well um as, as these sort of image standards change, it would be good to embed the accessibility data and the image description directly into the image so that you're not constantly having to reapply or rewrite the, the image descriptions. 
even if, even when we are using the same image in slides, I think Microsoft have actually improved this now. But I used to have a real bugbear where you would copy and paste slides because you were doing presentations and you'd done the image description and then you go back and suddenly find that your slides are no longer accessible because you're missing the image descriptions because you pasted without formatting and it took it all out. So do, do you foresee a time when it's going to be possible to, you know, have that metadata embedded in the images so that, you know, that once you've done the work once, you're not having to redo it? Because, I mean, there's, there's billions of images on the web, right? And there's only a few of you that are doing this professionally, and we know that AI hasn't really got there quite yet. So let you know how can we how can we stop the rework? Absolutely, thank you for bringing this up. It's actually already possible. Um, so about two two years ago now, I joined a, an organization called um, the International Press Telecommunications Council and they uh, manage the standards for metadata that you can embed in image files, so photo metadata. And uh, I joined because they didn't have alt text and extended description as metadata properties um, within the, their, their standard. And I said, well, this should really be information that we can embed in images. So um, I joined the and we submitted a proposal and within a few months uh, that the alt text and extended description properties were added to the metadata standard. So we can actually embed alt text and extended descriptions into image files and transport those descriptions with the actual image file between systems. So that's part of the standard now and uh, just needs to be supported by the different programs that are used. So um, that if we take, uh, if we have embedded uh, photo metadata, we drop that image into a document or upload it to social media, that that alt text is, is imported into the system and, and populating alt text. So what you've hit on here, Neil, is this need to preserve the alt text that has been written. So we're not duplicating efforts and writing alt text over and over again, because that experience is frustrating where even if we have the, the motivation and the goal and to write alt text and we do it, how do we save it? How do we yeah. get it from that social media post where I definitely wrote alt text over here to this system where I need it again? And that's where alt text is breaking down. That's where we're seeing challenges with workflows and where we can um, put a lot of efforts forward to improving the systems that support alt text. That's an area I'm really passionate about because that feels like an easy one. If we have humans writing alt text, then we can repurpose that if we just get organized around the systems that support alt text. Yeah, and and that was the, what was it? The IPTC was that? Yeah, right, okay. International Press and Telecommunications Council. Um, and yeah. also, we talked about language. There is a way to store alt text in multiple languages in photo metadata. So that is already supported, and that's something that we can use to improve systems for managing alt text in multiple languages. So um, this is something that I, I hope more systems and, and um, platform providers are paying attention to and supporting because this would really help users and content authors across the board. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, I have the will to do it once. I, I don't necessarily have the spoons to do it multiple times. And 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 I think that okay, the standards there, um, but yeah, it's then the adoption of the standards and the integration into the everyday systems because that's when it's going to really come and work. And, and thank you for putting in the groundwork on, on doing this, because it's it really is super important um, to as an enabler. So um, Absolutely. that's great. Yeah. And not to mention, we can also preserve the, the image description from the original creator of that image or from the image source provider we're licensing that image mm -hmm. from. Um, let's say you're you're licensing an image from Getty, um, and you can you know get access to the alt text that was written by Getty, um, or written by the original photographer. How fantastic would that be? Um, that's you know when we talk about the scalability of alt text, 
that's some scalability I can get behind because we're human scaling it. We're, we're just passing and preserving human um, written alt text, which is uh, great quality and, and from the original authors that care about that image and want to make sure that that information is correct. Absolutely. And, and Tony, did you have a... No, I was just, you know, you were talking uh, about uh, bringing uh, that metadata to social networks, but you said that um, today when we want to uh, write and have uh, correct implement our text on, on LinkedIn, uh, on Instagram or on Twitter, uh, all systems do it in different ways. Uh, how do you see that uh, being, what you're saying, being compatible with, with, with social networks? To facilitate the life uh, of of editors, of you know, people working on, for companies or agencies, we have to do that that work, you know, uh, systematically. Right. So there are a lot of systems operating behind social media platforms. A lot of people use social media scheduling services. Um, there are many popular um, ones out there, and that's uh, a, an obvious place where you could import alt text into a social media scheduling service where you're publishing to multiple platforms. So um, it's connecting the dots, right? Does that social media scheduling service you use support image metadata or can they help you with you know, managing your alt text in that system? And then do they have the integrations in place to send that alt text to all the social media platforms? So that's some, that's what I'm talking about in terms of workflows, how we can really dial it in and connect the dots here and help people um, improve the, the, the alt text. So they don't actually have to um, remember to, um, to manually add it every single time. That's the problem right there is, is the requirement to manually add alt text and to ask users to jump through, you know, multiple clicks and, and um, go into advanced settings and, and add alt text. That's not... Um, that's not actually right. what we'd but, expect. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about you know those, those providers that will allow you to schedule. They all all uh, I would say that looking at all of them, they were really late adopters of our text. It took them years after the APIs in the systems allow it. Uh, some of them who are very popular are, are are only doing it for less than a year. So are you confident that now they will do it or they are going to? We're going to have a, another five years for, for them to, to do this right. Right. This is where advocacy really comes in and what I, I came up against, where when we added the, the alt text and extended description metadata properties to the standard, I thought within a year, um, we're going to see widespread adoption across um, platforms and programs that, uh, that are looking for solutions. And... I was surprised that that just didn't happen, that it's it's out there, it's available, we can use this, and you're not doing anything about it. And there's this challenge coming up against, um, well, we're not hearing this from our users. Like, we're, like this is just what you want. Um, <laughs> uh, and we need to hear it from our users. And then in some cases, pointing directly to um, public forums where, yes, you are hearing this from your users four years ago. How, how are you not doing it? Um, that's not an, a, an excuse, um, but it's that classic kind of, well, what are our internal priorities here? Yeah. Um, and this keeps get, getting knocked down. It's always later um, with alt text. And it's surprising because it's such a basic accessibility requirement that we should have dialed in at this point. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not just people not writing alt text, it's the systems they're using, not supporting it. Yeah, agreed. Um, and and there's a couple of points I want to pick up on there. I mean, from a corporate point of view, we chose our platform for you know social advocacy because it did support alt text. It was one of the key requirements for us as choosing it. So as a as a group, right? Not as an accessibility team, but as a, a large billion, multi billion dollar euro enterprise, we chose it because it supported alt text and other accessibility features. Um, but the workflow is still a challenge um, because you know you still got to get humans to do it. But 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 the thing that we've now 
got going on is that we we're, we're now actually getting reporting metrics from that platform as to the the proportion of the the posts that are created that have alt text so we're able to then have measurements and track progress and nudge people along and so on and so forth i think with the persistent metadata if if they were then to support the standards that would be really helpful and i wonder whether there's also a tag that might need to be added to say verified written by human or you know, checked by human as meaningful, um, that would be also to be embedded. Um, because then, then again, you have a, a, you're building in a layer of trust into a system that, that the thing is meaningful, and you can automate and you can remove some of the additional manual work and rework. Um, so but I think that to come to the second point you've raised, <coughs> we've been working with resistance to um, the things that we want that no one else has ever mentioned for for a long time this this isn't uncommon um we see this with accessibility feature requests across all sorts of major platforms and 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 sometimes we end up having to sort of crowd uh you know get the the accessibility to community to share with each other feature requests to go and vote on them because um, it's that kind of stuff that then starts to move it up the priority ladder. Yes, we put them in. You get told, yeah, put it as a feature request. And then, of course, someone that basically wants dark mode as opposed to something slightly more complex. Everyone goes, oh, yeah, I want dark mode. So there's 3,000 votes. right? And, and um, you know, someone that wants image descriptions, you've maybe got 10 votes. Does it make it less important? No. But... The, the prioritization process is, is skewed in certain ways. So we do, there is that advocacy part that we still need to do to make industry adopt this stuff and see it as, a, as more of a priority, which I think is going to be ongoing work. There's, but there's sometimes a, a simple reason why they don't say that they're not listening from their users is because their users don't use their systems because they're not accessible. So you will never hear from those users because <laughs> you don't have them. You know that that's the reason why. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You don't have any users because they're excluded. Yes. Okay, Deborah. Sorry, I interrupted. And, and Carolyn, I'm sure you may have some points. Well, I just would like to say to Carolyn, I really appreciate the work that you're doing, um, being in the field a long time and seeing how money flows. Um, it, it worries me about all this amazing work you're doing. And I'm hoping that um, some corporate brands are going to step up and support this um, kind of work, because I think that there's a lot that needs to be done at the base that we are doing that. Um, I see brands doing a lot of things, but um, I'd, I'd like to see them do more things that are actually helping our community. So I think this right here is a perfect opportunity for uh, funders to see what we need and what we need funded. Because so much of the funding I see coming in from funders, from investors and stuff, once again, um, appear to be trying to make um, one accessibility company more successful than another and forgetting the point of we're actually working on something here to make sure all humans are meaningfully included. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, a lot of people becoming more enlightened about what we're doing here. But what do you see, Carolyn? Uh, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and the world would work the way you think it should work, what would that look like? Because I think there are people listening now. There are, you know, we appreciate the brands like Atos that has made these things, um, trying to blend them really into the DNA. They're not the only ones. We have other groups that have tried. I do a shout out to Siemens, SAP. There's other, there's a lot of, there's not a lot, but there's some brands that are trying to do the right thing. But I, I, I still feel that most of the efforts are real check the box and not meaningful. I mean, like, I don't care what you put out there as an alt tag, just get something out there and don't say image one. Um, don't say graphic one either. So understanding the true needs, the true, true needs of our community, I think is something that uh, corporations still need to do a lot of work on. And so do funders. But 
I was just, you know, I, I, only because I don't want you, Carolyn, to have to walk some of the path I've had to walk and others uh, where our work is not funded, but we're expected to do the work anyway because we care about this community being meaningfully included. But what, what would um, the world look like if we um, started really getting that people wanted to be meaningfully included, not just your little checkbox inclusion? Yeah, um, if if I could wave an, a magic wand, then uh, organizations would hold themselves accountable to the alt text that they're publishing, uh, just like any other content they're publishing. Uh, it's part of that process. It needs to be integrated into that process. Um, content, when we publish it, needs to be born accessible from the beginning. And just because something can't be done fast doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, right? This is an important part of accessibility, of, of publishing content on the web. And it need, we need to figure out these challenges. If it's writing the content, let's solve that. If it's the workflows, uh, we can solve that too. It's just not an excuse anymore to me. Um, and we need to be we, we need to be reaching for a higher standard um, at the organizational level. Oh, and even Neil was clapping during that. Usually I'm over here doing all this, but well said, Carolyn, well said. Um, over yeah. to you, Neil. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I fully agree. Uh, not everything can be done in a hurry. We, we're very much in, a, in one of those points in history where everything seems to be in a hurry again because there's a new technology and everybody's tremendously excited and competing. And um, I think we're back round the circle again where we're moving fast and breaking things. And I am concerned about that. Um, I think that sometimes we need to move purposefully and fix stuff. And as you say, making sure it's born and accessible. So um, thank you so much for joining us today, spending the time sharing your knowledge and the work that you're doing, which I think is fantastic. And also thank you to our sponsors, Amazon and MyClearText for keeping us online and keeping us captioned and accessible. So thank you, Carolyn. And I really look forward to you joining us on Twitter for continuing the discussion. Thank you all. Thanks for having me.